Pig. Hey everyone, welcome to Logan Smosh Pig. Glad to have you here. Do me a favor and please subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks a lot for tuning in to a new episode of Rock and Read. Today we'll read Chapter 8 of The Lives of Brian, written by ACDC's longtime lead singer, Brian Johnson. Without further ado, let's see what happens next. It was summer, 1966, and we were driving down the A1 to Dover to go on our first international holiday to my Italian side of the family's house in Frascati, near Rome. By we, I mean George Beveridge, Robert Conlon, and me. England were beating Germany 4-2 to two in the World Cup at Wembley. What a day! We gave two fingers to every German car we saw. This was the life. Three 19-year-old lads and a quite new Renault 4. It was Rob Conlin's. He was an only child. Lucky. We were going where our fathers had been 20 years earlier. But we weren't going to get shot at. We boarded the ferry at Dover and the cars were just unbelievable. Aston Martin's 4s and 5s, Bentley Continentals, Vassell Vegas, Ferraris, even a Gullwing Mercedes, all on one ship. We couldn't believe that there were so many rich people in the world. This was a time when you were really proud to be British. Honest. The Beatles and the Stones ruled the world. Minis were selling everywhere. Though in Italy, they were made under license and called Innocenti. British bikes still ruled the roost. Norton, Triumph, BSA, Ariel, James. We were off. The ferry left the port, and for the first time in my life, I saw what the White Cliffs of Dover Fuss was all about. The drive through France, Switzerland, then northern Italy. Then, on the well-named Autostrada Sud to Frascati, was just wonderful. We had a great time, and suddenly realized that cars were everything to the Italians. The beautiful Alphas, Giuliettas, Lancias, they were a little different. When we left, after two great weeks, little did we know what was about to happen to us. The family loaded us up with cardboard boxes full of wines and hams and salamis. We were hemmed in pretty good. Off we set, late as usual, and got lost a few times trying to find the road out of Frascati. After driving through the night, Robert Conlon was pretty tired by about 4 a.m. He wouldn't let George or myself help him drive in case we broke the gears. I swear, that's what he said. So, we slept as best we could in the car. We were about a third of the way through France on the dreaded N7 auto route, notorious in motoring fraternities for death and destruction. We had to get to Calais for the ferry, or we'd miss work in Newcastle on Monday. The day was Saturday, and the ferry ticket said 4.30 p.m., departure. If we kept going, only stopping for patrol, we'd be okay. Rob didn't look that good, so we volunteered our driving services, but we were denied yet again. George Beveridge said to me, hey, how about a swap, Brian? I'm sick of sitting in the back. The back did look like a mobile grocer's, but it was my turn, so we swapped. That was the best swap I ever did in my life. One hour later, on the N7, there was a family of four having a picnic at the side of the road by their Peugeot estate. We had just passed a car full of English nurses, and we waved to each other. Rob Conwin fell fast asleep at the wheel, doing 70 miles per hour, and before we could do anything, he hit the Peugeot full on. Everything turned black and white. I mysteriously went completely deaf. And it's true. 
It was all in slow motion. Holy! Is this thing ever going to stop rolling? It went over seven times, according to witnesses. The roof of the car was flattened to the door handle level. There was complete silence. Then, the screaming started. Rob Conlon was the screamer. The steering wheel had collapsed, and the ignition key had gone through his rib cage. George had been catapulted out of the front seat into a field. I was trapped. This car was rear-engined. There was no way out. <sighs> I took deep breaths and checked for blood. None. That's not possible. Ooh, you jammy. I thought. The bloody, awful French sirens were getting closer. Voices surrounded the car. English voices, girls' voices, nurses' voices. I sat and waited to be rescued. But the problem was, they didn't know I was there. They couldn't see me. I must admit to a smidgen of panic because the car was on its side. Patrol was leaking everywhere and the engine was hot. I started shouting, but I was told later that everybody was looking after Rob or in the field with George, who had horrendous injuries. I decided to try to get out through the engine bay, daft bugger. I pulled the seat away, not difficult in 1960s Renaults, put my hand through and promptly burned myself. I screamed, Ooh, yeah! Just then, a fireman saw me and shouted, something. They got me out and laid me down. Shock was setting in now, and the enormity of the swap I did with George. There was my best pal on a stretcher, looking so dead, being rushed into an ambulance. Oh, George, don't die. Everybody was looking at me kind of weird. I couldn't understand it. I'd just survived a major prank, and they were looking at me like it was my fault. Then, the policeman asked if we had been drinking, and that's when I realized I was drenched in Italy's finest wine. The only reason we weren't done for that was because I pointed out that all the corks were still in the bottlenecks, and that's when the pain in my chest kicked in. So... I hadn't got away with it. It was an inside job. Three broken ribs. I was put in a village B&B. &B. They were so nice to me. The others were in hospital. I'll never forget that night. I was alive, but I didn't know if George was. Next day, I went to the hospital. The lads were alive. A little battered, but that didn't matter. We had no money at all, so all we worried about was getting out of there. George had stitches all over his face and was still bleeding. What he did was, I rubbed some of his blood on my face, jumped into bed, and pretended to be George, while George, with Rob's help, dressed in a cupboard. We then proceeded to the train station to catch the train to Paris, with hospital staff chasing us to pay the bill. A wonderful guy from the British Embassy had got us tickets to England on the boat train, but it was to London only. We had no money for food, and God, we were hungry. When we got to King's Cross after walking through London with our clothes and cardboard boxes, we got three tickets home by promising to pay the people who had lent us the money back within a month. Finally, on Sunday afternoon, we arrived in Newcastle. What must we have looked like? George with a young Frankenstein, and me with blood all over my trousers. That's when Rob Conwin pulled out his wallet and said he was getting a cab home. The bugger had had money all the time. George and I dragged our sorry asses to Dunstan, our home village, about four miles away. At 7.25 on Monday morning, 
I clocked on at C.A. Parsons and Company, broken ribs and all. George went to hospital to get more glass out of his face. He still has a piece in his head to this day. A few weeks later, my apprenticeship over, Parsons came good and offered me a permanent position. I was a proper grown-up now. And no, I didn't much like the sound of that either. Well, that's the end of Chapter 8. Let me know what you thought of Chapter 8 in the comments below. That does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Till then, rock on.